What happens when you take Ukraine's battlefield-hardened drone designs and move them into the heart of German industrial capacity? You don't just get more drones, you get a strategic problem for Moscow that can't be solved with a missile strike, a blackout, or a sudden spike in jamming on the front, because this isn't a feel-good business headline, it's a production story, and production is what decides wars when the miracle weapons fade and the daily math takes over. How many systems can you field? How many can you replace? How fast can you adapt when the enemy changes tactics this week, not next year? That's why the joint venture between Germany's quantum systems and Ukraine's frontline robotics is so consequential. The new entity, Quantum Frontline Industries, is being described in blunt, utilitarian terms. Ukrainian-designed drones built on an industrial line in Germany at scale for Ukraine. The reporting around the partnership points to a deal in the range of 100 million euros and a stated target for 2026 of around 10,000 drones produced from a new facility in southern Germany. 10,000. That number matters because it signals something bigger than aid. It signals a pipeline. Now ask yourself a simple question. What is the single most reliable way Russia has tried to slow Ukraine's defense production? It's not only about shooting down drones. It's about attacking the ecosystem that creates them. It's the strikes on workshops, warehouses power infrastructure, logistics hubs, it's the attempt to keep Ukraine in a permanent state of improvisation where every batch is heroic, every delivery is uncertain, and every factory can be turned into rubble. Shifting a meaningful portion of that drone production into Germany changes the geometry. You can jam a drone, you can hunt an operator, you can even saturate an area with air defense, but you can't easily crater a German production line without triggering a completely different level of escalation. And that is exactly why this development should make Moscow uncomfortable. It takes a category of Ukrainian wartime innovation, rapid, iterative, brutally practical, and welds it to an industrial base Russia cannot touch in the same way. To understand why that matters, you have to understand what drones have become in this war. They are not an accessory. They are a primary layer of combat power. They find targets, they correct artillery, they deliver munitions, they hunt vehicles, they interdict movement, and increasingly they fight each other. The front line has become an invisible knife fight in the radio spectrum, with both sides jamming, spoofing, shifting frequencies, and constantly adjusting tactics. The drone that works today might be compromised tomorrow, and the side that can iterate fastest and replace losses at scale keeps the advantage. So the key issue is not whether a drone is good. The key issue is whether the system is sustainable. Can you produce enough of them to keep units supplied the way infantry are supplied with ammunition? Can you maintain quality documentation and spare parts? Can you keep the pipeline flowing when the enemy is actively trying to collapse it? That's where industrial scale stops being a buzzword and becomes a weapon. Boutique production, small workshops, clever volunteer networks, these were essential in the early phases and they still matter, but a long war punishes anything that can't scale. When thousands of drones are being expended for a few kilometers of ground, hand-built becomes a constraint. Repeatability becomes everything. The partnership also shines a spotlight on the kinds of drones being prioritized. Two systems repeatedly mentioned are Zoom and Linza. Zoom is described as an electronic, warfare-resilient reconnaissance drone. And that phrasing, EW resilient, should trigger immediate attention, because the hardest part of drone operations in Ukraine is not airframe design. It's surviving in the worst RF environment on the planet. The spectrum is hostile, jammers appear and disappear, bands get saturated, control links get attacked, navigation gets spoofed. A drone that can't handle that environment is a training drone, not a combat drone. Reported specifications characterize Zoom as a small ISR platform with a tactical range around 15 kilometers and flight time over 35 minutes with stabilized day optics and thermal capability. On paper, those numbers might sound modest to someone used to glossy brochures, but context changes everything. 15 kilometers in a contested EW environment is not the same as 15 kilometers on a test range. 35 minutes while being actively hunted by jammers, electronic direction finding, and counter UAS teams is not a marketing metric. It's survival time. And this is where many outside observers miss the point. Reconnaissance drones don't generate the viral explosion clips, but they quietly enable the kill chain. They spot the hidden position in a tree line. They find the vehicle under camouflage. They detect the heat signature that gives away a squad that thinks it's invisible. They turn uncertainty into coordinates, and coordinates in this war are lethal. Linza plays a different role. It's described in Ukrainian reporting as a bomber-style UAV with a gyro-stabilized camera and digital zoom, able to carry up to about 2 kilograms of payload out to roughly 10 kilometers. That payload isn't just about strikes, it can also be used to lay mines, which sounds clinical until you remember what it means at ground level, restricting movement, channeling forces, forcing choices, and turning safe routes into risk. One detail associated with the system tells you it's designed by people who have learned lessons the hard way 
an external antenna that allows the operator to control the drone from cover. That is not a luxury feature, it's a survivability feature. It's the difference between operating and getting spotted, targeted and killed. So why does Germany matter here beyond simply producing more units? Because Germany brings industrial depth, process discipline and the kind of manufacturing culture that turns we built a clever thing into we built 10,000 consistent things. There's a reason NATO standards matter even when they sound boring. They are not glamorous, but they win wars through sustainment. They force documentation. They enforce consistent assembly. They reduce the chaos of mismatched components. They create a fleet you can maintain without relying on improvisation and luck. And then there is the supply chain dimension, which is quietly one of the most strategic parts of this entire story. Drone production globally has been constrained by component dependencies. When parts come from suppliers you don't fully control, your production tempo becomes vulnerable to politics, trade shocks and sudden shortages. Frontline has been associated with efforts to reduce reliance on Chinese components. A Germany-based production model potentially expands sourcing options, improves quality control and increases resilience if one supplier goes dark. That's not a minor detail. In a war where losing drones means losing eyes and losing eyes means losing people, continuity is everything. Now imagine the operational outcome if this production line performs as advertised. Ukraine gets a steadier flow of reconnaissance and bomber drones, built with repeatability, supported with life cycle processes, and delivered in quantities aligned with Ukraine's Ministry of Defense requirements. Not a one-off shipment, not a symbolic batch, a sustained stream. What does that do to battlefield behavior? It changes risk calculus at the unit level. A squad that knows it can get replacement drones is more willing to use them aggressively. A commander who expects consistent ISR coverage can plan fires and maneuver with tighter cycles. A brigade with predictable resupply can integrate drones as standard equipment rather than special assets. This is how technology stops being exceptional and becomes normal, like radios, like optics, like ammunition. And once drones become normal, the side without the pipeline starts bleeding efficiency every day. Of course, Russia will respond, it will jam harder, it will refine spoofing, it will expand counter UAS tactics, deploy nets, build kill zones, hunt operators and push electronic warfare closer to the front. But here is the uncomfortable question for Moscow. What if the answer isn't to make each drone perfect, but to make the drone ecosystem inexhaustible? What if Ukraine's advantage is not in having a best drone, but in having enough drones, good enough, constantly improving and constantly replaced? That is the Perun-style logic of attrition applied to the air at low altitude. Cheap, fast, replaceable systems that survive jamming well enough to do the job, produced in volumes that keep pace with loss rates. And this is exactly where Western defense culture has often struggled. It loves exquisite systems and long procurement cycles. It loves requirements documents that protect careers. Ukraine does not have that luxury. Ukraine builds what works now, then improves it, then improves it again in a feedback loop driven by combat. Germany stepping into that loop is the real story. It's not simply Germany helping Ukraine. It's Germany integrating Ukrainian combat innovation into European industrial production. And once that integration exists, it becomes harder to unwind politically and economically because it turns support from donations into capability. It also sends a signal to every European defense ministry watching this war. The future model is co-production shaped by battlefield feedback, not peacetime assumptions. So picture the end state, a factory line in southern Germany producing drones designed under air raids and blackout conditions, standardized into an automated industrial process and shipped directly to the force that needs them most. Each unit is not a wonder weapon, it is something more strategically dangerous to Russia, a steady practical edge, the kind of edge that accumulates day after day until it becomes operational momentum. Russia wanted Ukraine isolated and exhausted, instead Ukraine is wiring itself into Europe's industrial base one production line at a time, and if this works it won't stop at reconnaissance drones and small bombers, it becomes a template for loitering munitions, for counter drone systems, for ground robots, for the unglamorous sustainment tools that keep soldiers alive. In a long war, the side that industrializes adaptation wins. The question is no longer whether drones will matter. The question is whether Russia can keep up with a drone ecosystem that is no longer confined to the range of its missiles.